Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to Let's Play Final Fantasy IX. We are back in Medain Sari after Iko got word from one of the Mughals that a precious treasure that had been stored in the village was stolen while we were at the Ifa tree. So now we have accompanied Iko back to the village and we are going to investigate what went missing and who the thief may have been. And the room that it was stolen from is through the dining room, through the kitchen, and down the stairs here. But first, we are going to go and pick up some of this coffee uh, for a side quest. Yeah, we are not going to ignore all of the side quests. You are not the one I wanted to speak to. Someone came through with a big weapon shaped like an axe. So already, we're getting a pretty solid idea of who may have strolled through here for this precious stone. There was another theft of a precious stone earlier, which should be another big clue to the player, and a little bit of dramatic irony because by now we probably know who took it, while uh, the rest of the party, they're still a little bit in the dark, they don't seem to have caught on. Actually, no, this wouldn't be dramatic irony at all. We have the same information that they do, it's just that they aren't putting it together. Either way, how emotionally healthy is Zidane? He's just like, well, you could try to have a good cry. That's appropriate to do in this situation. It's a real nice release when you have all these really strong, tumultuous emotions brewing in you. You can just hit the release valve there. <laughs> Aww. And Iko, being young, thinks that it's not appropriate to do that because she thinks of herself as more mature than that, and adults don't cry. Meanwhile, you have Zidane, who is ostensibly an adult, pretty much close enough in this universe. Just being like, nah, it's cool. That's all good. God damn, I love Zidane so much. He anchors so much of the emotional weight of this story. Like, he's so good at what he does, like, his role in this, in this narrative pulls it off so well. So we heard Aiko scream from the distance uh, after she ran off by herself. And the scream was coming from this sacred site that we, uh, that we visited earlier. The Eidolon Wall. On the summoner village. Yeah, the ancestors will be displeased. The Iko got captured by someone. Uh, it's really nice that we get a full MP and HP restore here, along with a status ailment cure. And now we have confirmation that uh, the person who stole the precious jewel from uh, the village and it currently has her grubby hands on Aiko, uh, is in fact Lonnie. It was really helpful that the Moogles go and get some of these otherwise unreachable chests on screen to bring you uh, a few uh, a restorative and an exploder in case you don't already have the rune tooth that I think we synthesized. And now that we've made all our preparations, we've gotten healed up and all that, uh, we can go and confront Lonnie once again. Last time we saw her uh, was in Fossil Rue. And this time, she has Iko hostage. Remember what her prime uh, orders were from Queen Braun. Number one, her number one priority was to retrieve the pendant with the jewel that dagger wears around her neck. Uh, and her secondary objective was to kill Vivi. And then Amaranth also had his business with uh, Zidane, but we haven't seen Amaranth since then. 
And here we go. This is how the hostage exchange is ostensibly going to go down. Lonnie is going to have Vivi, one of her targets, bring the objective of her other, uh, her other mission to her. And possibly kill two birds with one stone. In one case, one of those birds is literally going to be killed. If not for a little bit of intervention. The rest of the party doesn't know that Lonnie was sent to kill Vivi, along with retrieving uh, the pendant. She comes to really quickly. The effects that sleep weed wore off right away. Hey, it's nice that Amaran shows up, though. Just to even things out. He doesn't want to be party to taking a child as a hostage. And work with hostage-taking scumbags. Yeah. So, Lonnie is going to peace out. But now we're uh, stuck with Amaran challenging us to a fight. And he still has his business, uh, again, specifically with Zidane. And this is going to be one of many one-on-one -on -one fights uh, for Zidane throughout this whole game. I've already had a bunch uh, back in Disc 1. Is this the first one we've had uh, since Disc 1? Uh, possibly. So the gimmick to this fight is that Amaranth is going to constantly uh, rope-a-dope his way around the screen. And I screw that up. But that's nice, it's instructive. Because what you're waiting for is that call-out. Here I go. Uh, that's when he sits still again in the middle of the screen. And when he is in the middle of the screen, that's when you can actually attack him. Otherwise, all your attacks just miss. And I think after this next hit, I'll probably... Ooh, no, I'll use the elixir now. That triggered a counterattack. That's really nice. I'll speed things along. Amaranth here has about 10,000 HP, so he should be... Uh, he should be a little bit more than bloodied at this point. Now we're just waiting for him to go back to the center and make the call out. There it is. So we can attack now. I think he'll take probably two more. I'm hoping that he gets me down to... Ooh. Good. I would have loved it if he had gotten me down to, like, some HP number ending in seven. Uh, so these skills that I never use. What they do is, uh, Soul Blade is a 100% chance to inflict status ailment procs from your weapon on enemies. Lucky 7 is a physical damage hit. It's, uh, insanely specific how you actually use it, and it's not that good. Uh, basically, if Zidane's current HP ends in 7, which is what I was hoping would happen at some point in that fight, uh, and you use Lucky 7, it will randomly do either 77, 777 or 7777 damage uh, and if the condition is not true it will just do one damage uh, so even if you high roll that and you meet the really specific conditions eh, it's it's okay at best like early on and in the mid game yeah 7000 damage is going to be a lot but that's a 1 in 3 chance, and you have to meet that really specific condition that Zidane's HP ends in a 7. So we get the pendant back, or we get the jewel back, rather. And we give it to Aiko. And things are all well and good. Amaranth escapes, he flees, and we get a better idea of the kind of character that Amaranth is going to be kept. We keep referring to him as red or scarlet hair, but I mean, it's easier to just refer to him by the name that I already know. It's not like a big reveal or anything. And I think by the end of uh, 
our business in Medain Sari this time. We're gonna learn that name anyway, so, eh. Let's visit Aiko one more time. She's been quiet the whole time. What is on her mind? Again, we shouldn't leave the she shouldn't leave the village she feels until she's 16, but she really wants to go with them. Does it really matter what I say? You've already made up your mind. Yep. And I like how he doesn't put it upon himself to convince her. And he knows that Vivi is the right person to talk to her and not even convince her to do one thing or the other just to be honest with herself because that's the advice she gave to Vivi god this is so strong this is such a strong stretch of the game it's so good fucking FF9 oh my God, this is such a good game. Yeah, they're both all right. You're always so nice to Mog. It's because they're best friends. We're, they were born on the same day. Also, I, I think the wings on her back they have really not been prominent all that much, given like some of the angles that we've seen on screen. It wasn't really noteworthy until Lonnie pointed them out uh, earlier on. She uh, was grabbing Aiko by those wings. They might be some kind of send up to Renoa. Going the wrong way again. Now we're gonna take a no wait, what was that? Thought she was at the idol on wall, but she might be down here. Can hear a song. There's melodies of life again. This is a part of a Dane Surrey that we've never ever seen. This cove with a pretty haggard looking ship. Oh, and this conversation! It's all because you made the effort to learn. No, it's because you stuck with me, she says. And in this moment where she's being really glum and self deprecating. Aw, give me a little bit of a shout out and praise to Kina. This is where it gets really good. Where she goes deeper into her fears and her anxieties and like this this feeling of hopelessness and, and pessimism that she's trying to overcome and that she's using everyone around her as an anchor to to or as a buoy, I should say, to keep her buoyant with all this turmoil going on. Oh, man. Hold on. Get back to that thought. Because we're talking about Ibsen, a character from a play based on a real person. Ibsen and his good friend Colin worked at a tavern in Trino. One day, Ibsen got a letter. The letter was so wet from rain that most of the writing was illegible. The only part he could read said, come back home. Nowadays, we have airships and stuff, but back then, it was really hard to travel. He didn't know why he had to go back, but he got some time off, gathered his things, and set out on his journey home. Walked a thousand leagues through the mist. Sometimes he was attacked by vicious monsters, but he made it because his friend Colin was by his side. And then after much time on the road, he said he had to ask Colin something. Why did you come with me? And Colin answered, only because I wanted to go with you. No reason other than, hey, they're friends and they're there for each other. God, 
God, this is such a, a rich, emotionally honest game. Like, that's, that's the thing. It's so open and earnest and sincere. You believe these characters. It is so deeply evocative. That's really always grabbed me. It's, it's about friends helping each other through emotional terminal, uh, turmoil by just being decent and open and really willing to discuss how they feel with one another. Some very different after she hears another voice singing the song that she usually sings melodies of life with tornadoes swirling all about the big eye in the sky a burning city a younger looking dagger on a boat somewhere I have no memory of early childhood never really thought about it nobody ever told me she was raised in Alexandria, but only from the age of six or so. And figures she must have been here in Medain Sari up until her sixth birthday. About ten years, an unbelievably huge hurricane hit this village. That day, I was with my true mother on a little boat. Hmm. That song's from Medain Sari. That's why nobody else but Aiko knows it. Hmm. Why? That's the big one for me. Or rather, when I first played it, that was the question I was asking. Why doesn't she have a horn? Again, positive her biological mother died on the boat, and Braun is her adopted mother. Oh, and we get this special angle of the Eidolon wall. Used to pray every day here. Just like Aiko. This moment of bonding between them is fucking heartwarming. Ah, oh, man. I love this game so much. So Aiko's gonna break her promise to her grandfather, but that's okay because she feels positive now that this is what she's supposed to do. She's supposed to be with them. And she's, in a very short time, created some very real feeling bonds with all of the main party members uh, here. With Vivi, with Zidane, uh, and with Dagger especially. And it's amazing how quickly we've gone from this really silly kind of uh, played for comedic effect crush that she has on Zidane to actually looking up to him. And that's not because of like the magic power of friend, like the the anime power of friendship thing, but because like Zidane is sincere, you feel that like it's conveyed emotionally so well that it it makes sense, right? He he fits in to that spot in her life so perfectly.
It's very, like, everything feels, and again, like, purely from an emotional standpoint, very believable why all of this is playing out the way it does. Fuck, man, these, the characterization of FF9 is, I think, when I started this LP up, even by me, it was, it was underappreciated, and, and, a little bit, uh, I don't know, I guess it's a little bit undervalued. And hey, we're gonna get Amaranth, who admittedly is one of my least favorite characters, uh, to come along. Oh look, his name's Amaranth! <laughs> Some call me the Flaming Amaranth. Yeah, we're just gonna call you Amaranth, buddy. That's fine. And you can absolutely tell, like, the archetype that Amaranth fits. Oh no, this is the first time we actually get to do this. Um, I'm not replacing Vivi. I don't want to, but yeah, I think Iko's kind of the redundant one here. I don't necessarily even want to take Amaranth with me for uh, very long in the game, but I do want to at least show off what he can do, so Iko has to get cut here just for a little while. I could have also replaced Dagger. Maybe I'll sort that out between episodes. Uh, thank you all for watching. Take it easy. Have a good one.